Section 5.4, Indefinite Integrals and the Net Change Theorem. An antiderivative of f is called an indefinite integral, where the integral of f of x dx equals capital F of x means that the derivative of capital F is lowercase f. So basically, now that we have the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus Part 2, which relies on antiderivatives, we need a more convenient way of referring to antiderivatives. So instead of just using a capital letter and assuming that that means antiderivative, we're going to use an integral symbol without limits. And this integral symbol without limits is uh, an indefinite integral instead of a definite integral. So this is not defined as the limit of Riemann sum, even though it's using the same symbol. But it is uh, just an antiderivative, any general antiderivative. Let's do an example and find the uh, indefinite integral of 10x to the fourth minus 2 times secant squared x dx. So that's the indefinite integral, but that's just an antiderivative. So we can take out the 10 and write it as the integral of x to the fourth dx, take out the 2 and write it as the integral of secant squared dx. Then we use the power rule in reverse, raise the exponent, and divide by our new exponent. And then we have to think about what function has a derivative of secant squared. Well, that's just tangent. So the antiderivative of secant squared is tangent. Then we add a constant, because a gen most general antiderivative has some sort of constant at the end. Simplifying, we get 2x to the fifth minus 2 times tangent x plus c. And you can see that if you differentiate this, you do get 10x to the fourth minus 2 times secant squared. So that is an antiderivative, and that is th therefore the indefinite integral by definition. Let's evaluate the indefinite integral of cosine theta over sine squared theta d theta. In order to do this, we probably need to manipulate our function somewhat because we don't have an antiderivative of cosine theta over sine squared theta right off the top of our heads. However, if we split our fraction into two products, we get 1 over sine theta and cosine over sine theta, which are both familiar functions. 1 over sine theta is just cosecant theta and cosine over sine is cotangent. And we might remember that this is the derivative of minus cosecant. So that means the antiderivative of this is minus cosecant plus c, where c is some constant. Let's do another example and evaluate a definite integral. If we're evaluating a definite integral, then we have to use the antiderivative and evaluate it. So taking the antiderivative gives us x to the fourth over four minus six times x squared over two. But then we have to remember to evaluate this from zero to three. So that's one fourth times three to the fourth minus three times three squared minus one fourth times zero to the fourth minus 3 times 0 squared, which is just equal to 81 over 4 minus 27 minus 0 plus 0. So there's no contribution from our lower limit of 0. This ends up becoming negative 6.75. Notice that when you have an indefinite integral, it's an antiderivative, so that's a function. When you have a definite integral, you evaluate it, so you always just get a number. So they're very different, even though we use the same symbol. Let's find the indefinite integral of this function and interpret the result in terms of areas. So rewriting it, we get the uh, integral of 2x cubed minus 6x plus 3 over x squared plus 1 dx from 0 to 2. 
So that's 2 times x to the fourth over 4 minus 6 times x squared over 2 plus, well, this function is not immediately obvious what the antiderivative is. We have to think way back to when we were taking derivatives of inverse uh, trig functions. 1 over 1, 1 over 1 plus x squared has, uh, is the derivative of tangent inverse. So that means that 3 over x squared plus 1 is 3 times tangent inverse when we take the antiderivative. And we'll evaluate this whole mess from 0 to 2. So simplifying, we get half x to the fourth minus 3x squared plus 3 times tangent inverse from 0 to 2. And then we, we plug in uh, 2, so we'll start with b and then subtract a, which is 0. So half of 2 to the fourth minus 3 times 2 squared plus 3 times tangent inverse of 2. Notice, however, we'll subtract off 0 plugged in here, which is 0, 0 plugged in here, which is 0, and 0 plugged in here, which is 0. So there is no contribution from the lower limit of 0. So we simplify, we get minus 4 plus 3 times tangent inverse of 2, which is the exact answer. If we plug into the calculator, we can approximate this as negative 0.67855. In order to interpret this as a result of, uh, in terms of areas, we should probably take a look at a graph. So let's draw this, let's see. Looks something like this. That's a 2, and this is a 3. So here's what the graph looks like from 0 to 2. Notice that if we integrate over here, we get an area, which is positive. If we integrate over here, we get a negative value for that area, so it's like a signed area. And then over here, we get a positive area again. It looks like the area over here dominates, which it does because our answer is negative. So it's the sum of these areas, but we subtract this, way, this area. Let's evaluate the integral of 2t squared plus t squared square root of t minus 1 over t squared dt. Well, we should probably manipulate our function a little bit before we get started. So let's divide by t squared. So we get 2 plus t to the 1 half minus t to the minus 2 dt. Now we can integrate using the reverse power rule as our antiderivative. So we get 2t plus t to the 3 over 2 divided by the new exponent of 3 over 2 minus t to the minus 1 over minus 1, all evaluated from 1 to 9. Simplifying, we get 2t plus 2 thirds t to the 3 over 2 plus 1 over t from 1 to 9. So that equals 2 times 9 plus 2 thirds times 9 to the 3 over 2 plus 1 ninth minus 2 times 1 plus 2 thirds times 1 to the 3 over 2 plus 1 over 1. So it's not as much fun usually to integrate from 1 as it is to integrate from 0, even though 0 doesn't always end up canceling out. Sometimes you just end up with not even having to subtract anything off. In the end, we get all of these numbers that combine to give us 32 and 4 ninths.
using the fundamental theorem of calculus part two and replacing our notation by putting a derivative inside, we see that the, the definite integral of the derivative is the change in the value of the original function. So that implies that the if we integrate a derivative, we take an antiderivative of a derivative, then we get the net change of the original function. So for example, a particle moves along a line, so its velocity at time t is t squared minus t minus 6. Let's find the displacement of the particle during that time period from 1 to 4. So our displacement will be the change in position, s of 4 minus s of 1. So this is equal to the integral of velocity, because velocity is the derivative of position. So that's the integral from 1 to 4 of t squared minus t minus 6 dt, which is t cubed over 3 minus t squared over 2 minus 6t, all from 1 to 4. Evaluating that from plugging in 4 and then subtracting by uh, plugging in 1, we get negative 9 over 2. So that means that the particle ended up uh, moving 4.5 meters to the left. What if we want the uh, distance traveled during this time period instead of the displacement? Well, if we want the total distance, then we can't just integrate velocity because we could have some negative values that cancel out with some positive values. They just tell us the displacement. We need to integrate the absolute value of velocity if we want to get the distance because we have to only consider positive uh, values to all add up and stack up when we do our integral. So let's take a look at velocity. In our example, that's t squared minus t minus 6. So that's the same thing as t minus 3 times t plus 2. That implies that our velocity will be negative on the interval from 1 to 3. And our velocity will be positive on the interval from 3 to 4. If we plug in any number between 1 and 3, that makes this negative. Negative times a positive is negative. If we plug in any number bigger than that, I should close this, then we get positive times a positive, so it's positive. Now we can integrate because we can split up our velocity into its positive parts. We integrate the absolute value of velocity by integrating from 1 to 3 of minus the velocity. Because from 1 to 3, velocity is negative. So a negative times a negative will be positive, so we'll be integrating a positive function over there. Also remember that the way we define absolute value is in terms of piecewise functions. We have a negative part and a positive part. So then from 4 to 3, it's just the regular absolute value. We don't have to multiply by a negative because it's already positive. Doing these two integrals, we plug in for negative velocity, that's negative t squared plus t plus 6. And then for our regular velocity, it stays as t squared minus t minus 6. So our first integral becomes minus t cubed over 3 plus t squared over 2 plus 6t evaluated from 1 to 3. Our other integral becomes t cubed over 3 minus t squared over 2 minus 6t evaluated from 3 to 4. So that ends up becoming 61 over 6, which is approximately 10. 0.17 meters.
The figure shows the power consumption in the city of San Francisco for a day in September. P is measured in megawatts. So the power is in megawatts. T is measured in hours starting at midnight. Let's estimate the energy used on that day. Well, power is the rate of change of energy. In other words, P of T is the derivative of some energy function, E of T. So that means that if we integrate from 0 to 24, that's the end over there, P of T dt, then that will be the same thing as the integral from 0 to 24 of the derivative of energy. So that will be the net change of energy from 24 from 0 to 24. Let's approximate this value using the midpoint rule. You can choose uh, midpoint, left, right, your sample points anywhere. However, when you're doing approximations, the midpoint rule tends to be a better approximation than going left or right. So let's make uh, 12 subintervals, where each subinterval has a width of 2. So then we're doing the integral from 0 to 24 of p of t dt. We'll use that to get our net change in energy. And this is by equal to the power evaluated at 1, plus the power evaluated at 3, plus the power evaluated at 5, and so on until we get to the power evaluated at 21 and the power evaluated at 23. Notice we get these values because if we split this thing up into all of these little subintervals, each subinterval is two units long, then the midpoint is at 1, and then the midpoint is at 3, and then the midpoint is at 5, and so on. So we plug in all of those midpoints we don't forget to multiply by the width delta t of each of our intervals. And we end up with 440 plus 400 plus 420 plus 620 plus 790 plus 840 plus 850 plus 840 plus 810, plus 690, plus 670, plus 550, all times 2, which is equal to 15,840 something. Well, let's go back. P was in megawatts. T was in hours. So if we took the derivative, we would think it would be megawatts per hour. But we're not taking the derivative. We're taking the antiderivative. We're going backwards. So instead of dividing by hours, we should multiply by them. So our units become megawatt hours.